everyone, my name is Mahsa Ruhi. I'll be moderating this panel. I'm a joint research fellow with a uh, program on international security and project on managing the atom. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, especially with these amazing uh, speakers um, that you heard their insights. I'll start with a couple questions and then I try to be very brief and open up uh, for more discussions because all of these topics are very hot topics today. So. Um, I, I'll start with a question uh, for Jim. And you know, you mentioned in the previous panel how you know political scientists are very bad at predicting. And so I, I felt like in this panel you sort of contradicted yourself in, in terms of predicting how resilient MPT would be in the future. And I, I, I sort of want to play the devil's advocate and sort of challenge you on that and say where there has been some indications in the recent uh, uh, review conferences that shows dissatisfaction by other countries internationally. And um, how do you see uh, moving forward, uh, you know, dealing with these challenges and whether the MPT could survive this, or what are the steps that should be taken in order for, for the MPT to survive as it has in the past? Because yes, there has been a trend, but as you said, things could change. People would have said that about uh, Mubarak in Egypt. Uh, and, and it turned out, as you mentioned, we have had so many uh, of these instances in, in the history. So I'd be curious um, to hear your insights on that. And sort of that brings me to a second more optimistic theme that I picked up from your talk and also um, uh, Corey's, which is you both seem to suggest that um, as a recommendation or as a sort of future looking theme that let's take MPT as, as an existing with a fairly successful record or JCPOA as an existing uh, agreement with some success or the success that it has shown and instead of sort of say that this is not good enough and this is going to fall apart build on what has been successful in these two uh, and then what we can do in the future and so I, I would like you to sort of uh, expand a little bit more on that and see how forward looking what do you see as, um, as, as sort of um, steps that could be taken by the international community to whether, for instance, use the safeguard measures that you mentioned for Iran are particularly uh, helpful uh, and add to the MPT, could they be implemented in the future for another country or you know, was Iran a very particular case and no other country would basically abide by, um, by those rules? And uh, for, for Melissa, I would uh, like to ask you, how do you see over time the procurement channels sort of evolving? Has it become easier? She defined the procurement channel. Um, sort of illicit. Uh, I mean, you mean in the HACPLA? Is it what you mean? That no, 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 for North Korea. Oh, in general. I see. Yes, okay, general. sorry. My mistake. Excuse me. So uh, do you see that uh, basically these uh, tradings becoming easier over time, or do you see that it's become more challenging, let's say, for North Korea um, to, to obtain what it's been trying? And then it, it's the same for other countries. And I. Uh, I would like to say an, another case that I, um, uh, I focus on Iran's national security and its nuclear policy making myself. And one of the things that came up very often for it, within the Iranian debate on um, illegal sort of pr procurement of uh, these dual use technologies was that there, there are many costs associated with them. Not only they're very expensive, but also they Ha, they create a lot of sort of corruption networks within the country that the cost of dealing with them would also add to the cost of actually procuring these. Uh, these. And so I, I, I'm thinking for North Korea might be different, but it would be interesting to hear if other countries were to follow path, what would it mean for them? Is again North Korea an outlier case, as Jim mentioned, or is it something that moving forward will be, will be a challenge? And with your remarks, then we'll open. Okay, just briefly, I, I probably spoke uh, imprecisely, I'm sure I spoke imprecisely before. Uh, there's some things that social science is pretty darn good at in terms of predictions, and then there are other things it's just horrendous at. And it sort of really depends on the phenomenon, right? It's not that the science is always going to be good or always going to be bad. It's about the thing that you're studying and whether it lends itself to good predictions. And so we're terrible at predicting regime change. Everyone I know would admit that that's the case. Um, and whereas we're probably pretty good about other stuff. Um, the, why do I have some optimism? I, I agree that just because things have worked in the past, what's that thing about uh, past 
returns you know guaranteed for the future, whatever they say in IRAs or whatever it is, investments. I, I think that that's true, but at the end of the day, you have to make some probabilistic assessment whether something, given the data that you have, is it more likely to continue as it is or is it more likely to change? Always being open to the fact that there, there can be external shocks that scramble everything. But what we have for a record at, on the NPT uh, is, again, uh, not simply that the, we don't have a lot of nuclear weapon states, but what I think is really important in that is, and, and the declining trend line, is the candidate pool has shrunk. Now that could change too, right? And maybe Saudi Arabia and Kuwait or some could suddenly be, begin to get in the game, and I think we should be concerned about enrichment, the spread of enrichment and reprocessing. Uh, but the pool is definitely smaller. There's no doubt about it. And uh, I would say, Again, we've had lots of situations in which people thought the treaty was going to collapse. And, you know, we had a review contract. You know, people, the non-aligned movement folks are mad at us now. Well, they've been mad at us for since the Reagan era. We've had actual NPT review conferences that blew up without any sorts of agreements. I fear that's probably what's going to happen again this time. Uh, so you do see resiliency uh, in the NPT. And it is weathered, you know, it was... Uh, <coughs> Signed it or uh, produced in '68, opened for signature in '70. So that's 50 years or something where it's held up under all sorts of changes: collapse of the Cold War system, new entrance into the political game, you know, the Nuclear Weapons Club. So it's taken a lot of hits, and still it survived, and in some cases it's gotten stronger. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't be watchful. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be concerned about its health in the future. But again, the lesson I draw on is maybe we should pay attention to the things that work and build on those rather than always just focusing on the negative things and trying to stop them, right? Part of achieving a success is going after the bad things and building on the good things. But we only talk about going after the bad things. And when we talk about that, we only talk about sanctions and coercion. And so we have a really lopsided approach to a problem that we've had a tremendous amount of success with. And so I don't know where the NPT is going to be 20 years from now. Um, but I know if we want it to uh, continue to survive, that we should build on its strengths. And so that's the main lesson. So I'll be brief um, just to say that um, I do think there are elements of the Iran agreement that could be applied in other places. I think that the safeguards system, as I mentioned, has, you know, I, I wouldn't say it's constantly evolving. It kind of has from its authorities, it's evolved in more of a stepwise um, uh, approach. But in actual application and implementation on the ground, it has been a constant evolution. I and mean, we've gone from you know, paper-based to electronic-based data collection, when in some cases you have, are actually transmitting data in real time and off-site, the difference between you know, film cameras to digital cameras to, uh, to digital uh, you know, uh, video. Um, you know, so I think there are ways to look at where you know Iran has been able to be a test bed in some cases, and they wouldn't like me to say that, but it's, <laughs> but it's true. Um, and to look at where we might be able to, under existing um, international authorities, where you might actually apply those. And uh, after all, safeguards is generally a voluntary system, and any you know, so the safeguards agreement set a, a floor, but they don't set the ceiling. And any country can voluntarily. Um, uh, for either internal or external or regional reasons, accept either a, a, a different approach to their safeguards, whether it's you know kind of a different mechanism or a different amount of access um, and information that they're sharing. And and I think it's important for all of us to look at that. I mean, after all, I mentioned the additional protocol. We're still working to universalize that, but it's 21 years old this year. And in most places that are technology dependent, you'd never look at something 20 years old and say, well, we got it right. That's 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 the end of the process. So I think that we should be looking at what's next. So again, some of that comes from what are the existing authorities to try to avoid some of the political problems. And in some cases, we might want to push for a stronger system. I will say the one thing that I want to caveat is, and I yes, I literally always have a copy of the JCPOA with me, um, <laughs> is that there is an, a line in the JCPOA that says that nothing in the agreement shall set a precedent which basically means nothing will be assumed to be applied in other places, but that doesn't mean that it can't be on a voluntary basis. Um, so on North Korea's uh, procurement and proliferation, um, 
we have very sketchy data because the, it's sparse, right? The data is sparse, so it is hard to, to sort of say one, one overwhelming yes or no answer, and that's why people hate scientists. Um, I will say that the, the kind of ships that have been stopped, the materials have been coming down, sort of indicate to us that North Korea peaked at selling uh, Scud-type missiles in the 90s, and it's been going down ever since. Um, that being said, uh, you, know, you know, improved activities on borders and, and uh, banking activities, all of these things have helped. But it's also, you know, through, thanks to technology innovation, it's also easier to transfer information and materials than ever before. And it's easier to do banking and all these sorts of things. Um, so, we're facing a situation where nuclear and missile technology is getting easier and easier than ever before. I mean, people are always like, wow, how did North Korea do it so fast, so much faster than China or, or India or Pakistan? Well, they had the benefit of much better testing equipment, tools to do it, uh, better data, and just the diffuseness of information over the internet um, than has ever been before. So we're trying to, to, to prohibit things that are no longer just tangible objects that a customs officer can be like, no, that's not what it says is in the cargo hold. Now it's like ephemeral kinds of information. It's humans, right? So a disgruntled employee of so-and-so wants to have a, an interview <coughs> with a North Korean agent, it's a lot harder to stop. So that is sort of the challenge. Um, I, I, I am an optimistic person, so I always feel like, you know, technology is a double-edged sword. We going to keep, they keep moving the goalposts, we keep moving the goalposts. It's a cat and mouse kind of game. Uh, you always get the first question. <laughs> I actually have a cat waiting, so I got it. Uh -oh. um, well, it seems like you were suggesting that the, we should understand the origins of the North Korean nuclear program as coming right from the beginning of North Korea. Is that... Yes. Is that yes, I I mean, so I, I may be alone, but yes, Kim Il Sung said, "Let's have a nuclear program." They set up the physics schools to do it. it. Took them a long time to really get moving. They were recovering, but their economy has actually gotten worse since the '70s, and their nuclear and missile programs and Chem and Bio have probably all gotten. So better. we should understand that from when we look at denuclearization discussions, is understanding that we're yeah. at least declaratorily asking them to give up something that's from jump the establishment of yes. the state. The god of North Korea said it was so. Kim Jong Un, Kim Jong Il said it was so. Kim Jong Un said it was so. They will take it from his cold, dead hands. I mean, I don't think that there is anything you can offer, especially with Libya and Iraq and the back, floating around in the background. But I mean, you don't know until you ask. <laughs> I just want to say that I've heard the first ever comparison of Charlton Heston <laughs> and Kim Jong Un. <laughs> Yes, Jennifer Griffin with Fox News. A um, couple of questions. Uh, Corey, what are the flaws in the JCPOA that could be fixed, should be fixed? What, given the White House intent on so-called fixing the document, is there anything that could be dealt with without risking it all falling apart? Um, and I'd like to hear a little more about your involvement with discovering the Tons at some point. And Melissa, have you seen any evidence of any fake North Korean missiles in those parades like we used to see in the Soviet uh, parades? So um, I wasn't able to fly in in time to be at the dinner on Thursday night. So I think that Gary Seymour talked a little bit about the Iran deal. That's what I, I heard passing. And he acknowledged, you know, the, again, the so-called flaws. I, I hate that word. I hate saying that the JCPOA has flaws. Because I think what it assumes is that there was, that there is a, you know, a platonic ideal of a nuclear agreement with Iran that's out there and that this somehow falls short. Um, what I will say is, does, does the JCPOA permanently remove all capability from Iran that we would like to permanently remove? No, it doesn't. And it's, it would be, it's foolish to assert otherwise. Even as a supporter of the deal, I'm not gonna assert that. Um, but I will say two things. One is that um, I think that there is a, um, there is a, I, I feel like this is a new thing of trying to assume that every agreement should be the end point rather than the beginning point. I mean, we look back at the history of arms control. I mean, even the NPT was supposed to end after 25 years. 
And by the, when you got to 25 years, there was an agreement among all parties, which most really thought was almost impossible, to indefinitely extend that treaty. That's the exception, not the rule. And so, especially when you're looking at a bilateral treaty, I think if we, if we expected that we'd get to the end of each of these, you know, what have been deemed the sunset clauses, but all of these clauses that are time limited, um, and we said, all right, that we're going to put a cross through that one and move on to the next one on the list, then we're missing the point of the agreement. I think that the agreement, my, you know, my favorite phrase shared by many is, it was intended to be transformational and not transactional. So, you know, yes, it started with a tit for tat. You give this up, we'll, re we'll temporarily remove these sanctions. You give this up longer term, we'll remove sanctions in a longer term way. Um, so, first of all, I want to focus on the things that don't expire rather than the things that do expire. Because if we focus on the things that don't expire, and I named, you know, weaponization, commitment not to ha ever have a nuclear weapon, um, never to be able to reprocess or separate the plutonium from their um, research reactor, um, the, the, the so-called uh, Iraq um, research reactor, um, the 24-day inspection access right, um, otherwise there are actual named consequences. Um, I think these are things that if we don't talk about what, what lasts forever, then we'll, we could easily stumble into giving something up that we won't be able to recapture. Now, to the second part of your question, are there things we can do? Absolutely. I mean, first of all, in order for it to be transformational, we need to work on the transformation, which means we need to continue to work on implementation to the fullest extent. And that means Iran should do everything they are obligated to do and, and no less. And we should work on, um, the fact, on recognizing the fact that implementation is not just about sanctions lifting on our side. It's also about this technical cooperation. It's about converting their Iraq reactor to a design that doesn't produce weapons usable plutonium. It's, you know, there is a lot that has to do with implementation and it needs to be followed up on all sides. Um, we also need to recognize that you can't have it both ways. Either the deal doesn't include missiles and regional activity, or it does. Well, the fact is it doesn't. So if we acknowledge that it doesn't, meaning that we can't hold the deal accountable to the actions they make over here because that's not fair to say you're not doing this, therefore it's in violation of something that actually isn't in the deal. But if we say that it's not included, then we need to be able to work pretty hard to address those things in other channels. And I think there are things we could be doing to strengthen um, uh, the commitments of Iran that they've made at a political level, not to pursue more advanced long-range um, missiles, for example. Um, and we also need to be working very hard on their problematic, fundamentally and disturbingly problematic regional behavior. So I say, keep implementing the deal to its fullest extent, but in order to get all the benefit of it, we also have to be working on these other tracks, and I think we should do that. So to chime in on Corey's really good explanation, too, I would, I would also say, like, in order to get that economic benefit to Iran, there's probably some things that we could do to incentivize banks. Banks are terrified. I mean, it's just... It's risky. Iran is a risky customer. Clients in Iran are risky customer. Banks are just sort of staying away. So they're not quite getting the same economic boon of sanctions relief that people thought they were going to get. And so there's probably some dissatisfaction about that. And banks just don't want the risk. They're in. They're not a government entity. They don't have to do what you know they're, they're told to do. Um, so that's another kind of area. And then verification, too. Like, I know there's a lot of people who sort of feel like, oh, self-inspection. There's all this crazy, what's going on? How can, I, I, how can the IAEA handle the scope of all of this sort of stuff? But, I mean, with any monitoring or verification activity, I really think of it as like Swiss cheese, right? So if you have a slice of Swiss cheese, like, maybe there is a hole, like, there or there. But if you have a block of Swiss cheese, like, maybe, maybe Iran will get... Maybe they'll decide, you know what, we want to cheat. Maybe they'll get through one layer. But I just don't see, I mean, it is, it is actually a really well-written <coughs> verification uh, and monitoring sort of agreement. I just don't see how Iran can get through everything. That being said, it only covers nuclear, right? And so there's a lot of people who are like, damn it, I really wish we could control their missiles too. And their missiles are kind of scary. I'm not really super excited about Iran's missiles. And there's evidence of them cooperating with North Korea. Um, Human rights, uh, not so great. Um, terrorism, all bad things. But this was a nuclear agreement for a nuclear problem. And I think, like, I'm actually kind of shocked that it 
worked out as well as it has so far. That being said, Iran may try to cheat, and now it's all on you guys. You guys are part of the verification mechanism, um, and I am part of the verification <coughs> mechanism. They're part of the, and so there's official, and then there's, there's, you guys are now in the club, and you have to verify whether they're cheating or not. You guys have to snuff out myths about whether they're cheating out too. So we have a lot of problems with people saying, oh, Iran's cheating, and that story just gets like echoed and echoed and echoed, when no, it doesn't hold up to the smell test, they're probably not cheating. Because when that day actually comes and Iran decides to cheat, I really want to be right. Um, for North Korea and their fake missiles, so this is, um, yes, North Korea has fake missiles, I guess. Um, it's sort of semantics. Um, if you were to parade uh, a, your real missile, then uh, you give away information about how many you have, where they're coming from and where they're going to. Believe me, I have hired satellites to, because that's what I want. Like every day that North Korea has a parade is my favorite day. And you've <laughs> probably seen me tweeting uh, with like a whole group of people around the world who just want to watch. And, and, and we watch in the videos and the ground photos, but we also watch from space now too, because it's suddenly, an, it's, a, it's a somewhat affordable option. So yeah, you were also tracking, right? You tracked all the trucks lining up ahead of the parade, and then you better believe that multiple intelligence agencies and now crazy academic ladies are watching where do all those trucks go after the parade? Where did they come from in the first place? That kind of thing. And we're trying to figure out what is the pattern of life in North Korea? What is a normal traffic day in North Korea? What is a parade traffic day in North Korea? What does a launch or a test day look like? And so there's a lot of really interesting um, artificial intelligence and, and sort of object detection and change detection um, algorithms that are going into solving that problem. So do they parade fake missiles? Yeah, they do, unfortunately. And sometimes they give us fake pictures of real missiles. And so we also have to use software and like digitally comb through those things. Um, the missiles that go on parade, like it's not in there, like, you know, it's also kind of dangerous to, to parade them around. Generally, what I think of them are design concepts. And there was a few missiles, we called them KN-08. It got paraded a, a few times, and it got modified a few times. And it was probably a design concept for the Hwasong-14, Hwasong-15. Um, and so I guess we could say, yeah, haha, terrible welding. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't look like it's going to fly. I do fight continually with German engineers who are like, this is not safe enough, or this is not good enough. <laughs> but, but North Korea is in a different position, like, right? Like if they hit Palo Alto instead of San Francisco, that's still really bad. And they know that we know it's still really bad. And so yes, when you see hand welding or you see that it's, it's not the most sophisticated material, it wasn't done with the safety of the scientists in mind, especially their bioweapons program, then you're probably underestimating how, how much North Korea values these weapons over other, other things. Can I, offer, can I offer a quick comment on Iran? And by way of preface, uh, to inoculate myself, so I'm not called an Iran softy, uh, how many of you have been detained by Iran, Iranian security officials? Raise your hands. I was prohibited from going, yeah. so I couldn't be detained. Yeah. No one in the audience. Well, I have. You know? But I bet, like me, you have friends who in Iranian prisons. I have at least four, three are out, one I helped get out. So I'm aware of the capacities of the regime. That said, it was my testimony before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee that the JCPOA is the strongest multilateral non-proliferation agreement ever negotiated. You didn't hear that much during the debate. And so for those of you who are skeptical about that, I want you to tell me what is the more robust agreement. It's not the NPT, it's not the Proliferation Security Initiative, I don't think it's the Olympia Agreement. I told you how the NPT, as flawed as it was, had this impact because of the nature of the how it changed the political calculus. I'm reminded of what the DNI has repeatedly testified to, which is Iran has a nuclear weapons capability. You cannot bomb the knowledge out of their heads of how to build a centrifuge. Their decision is essentially a political one. And the agreement is meant to put them on a political track so that they do not revisit that and ever make, quote, the bomb decision. Now, our current policy 
is to beat them with a the stick. Right? So when the agreement goes away, or do you think they're going to be in a, you know, a more positive, do you think that's going to help the political track push this off in one direction? Or are we going to go back to a period of hostility and then whatever the consequences of that are? Um, oh, I forgot to use this joke. So I used this joke in front of a CENTCOM audience. It's only the second time I've used it. So I say this thing about, you know, how many of you have been arrested? Blah, 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 and I said, so Iran and I are not in bed together. We're not even dating. Yeah, I thought it was funny, you know. <laughs> That's the second time no one has left it. But I also want to say, very briefly, I think in a lot of the ways people write a lot about Iran and its missile program and its regional meddling without any context whatsoever, right? So terrorism. Is Iran the, uh, this is, you know, de rigueur, if you're a Democratic or Republican congressperson, say the leading state sponsor of terrorism. You know who I think is the leading state sponsor of terrorism? I think most of my terrorists and colleagues agree. Pakistan. All that stuff that Bippin was telling you about? That's funded by Pakistan. What are the, you know, the majority go to the University of Maryland ta uh, Terrorism Database? Study written, 90% of the deaths from terrorism are committed by Sunni terrorists. Not being committed by Iran or Iranian Shiite proxies. They're being committed by Al-Qaeda, Al-Shabaab, you know, on and on and on. Um, meddling. So they're meddling. And they are. Why? Because people in that region have meddled in each other's affairs for decades, going back to the Shah, Saddam, Nasser. So, and we have this conversation about meddling. Saudi Arabia kidnapped the Lebanese prime minister, forced him to resign on TV <coughs> until he was rescued, essentially, by the French president. So he just went back. Did he go back? Yeah. So, I, I don't know. That sounds like meddling to me. You know, what about uh, quarantining gutter, where we have a US, our biggest US base? What about blocking humanitarian aid into Yemen? I call that meddling. So, do I wish the, uh, do I want the uh, uh, Iranians, you know, I think they're supporting, when they support Assad, they're supporting a war criminal. That's my view, because of the chemical weapons. But, you know, let's have actually a reasonable conversation about this. This is not unique to Iran, and they're probably not the worst. Uh, in my view, they're the third ranked military power in the region. You, you, when you say you're a third ranked state, well, I think Israel has more powerful military, and I think Turkey has more powerful military. And I think Saudi Arabia spends five to seven times more in its military than Iran does. But you can debate whether military spending in Saudi Arabia is a good metric because how much capability are they getting for their spending. But, you know, it's a more complex picture than you would guess from listening to speeches on the floor of the House and Senate. And for missiles, uh, you know, somehow people forget that Iran was attacked by missiles. You know, I don't know. Is there a country whose cities have been attacked by missiles? who don't go and build missiles to deter another attack? I mean, if you can name one, I'd be interested in that. <laughs> you know? So some of this stuff is just otherworldly. Now, again, I'm not carrying any water for them. What I'm pleading for is maybe recognizing that the Middle East is a rough and tumble place where a lot of people do bad things to one another. I can ask you to please yeah. link to so uh, when the JCPO was negotiated, was it only about Iranian nukes or other components like the regional stability, particularly the Afghanistan policy? Uh, now the current administration wants to pursue an Afghanistan policy while uh, going after Pakistan on one side and Iran on another side. So it would make sense for an outside observer that if US had better relations with uh, Iran, it might also help the US strategy in Afghanistan. So did the JCPO take into account that component of how Iran, uh, better, better engagement with Iran could be useful in a lot of other uh, pieces of the puzzle in, in the region? So the negotiation of the deal was scoped specifically to the nuclear problem. Now you could argue that, the, that by solving the nuclear problem you open up the space to then address these other issues and this, you know, the disagreement I had, would have with Jim on what he just laid out is that just because everybody else is doing bad things doesn't mean we also shouldn't be worried about Iran doing bad things. And so I, I think that, that it is fair game to talk about Iran and the challenges they pose. And I do think they pose a fundamentally different challenge than some of the other you know, 
uh, instances that, that Jim named. But I will say on this point, there was, it wasn't decided early on that it would be so narrowly scoped. And the decision was, if we went after a comprehensive agreement, first of all, we might never get it, obviously. But more importantly, all those other issues become harder to deal with if you add an Iran with nuclear weapons on top of them. So the prerequisite to addressing, long, especially long-range missiles, not necessarily regional, but long-range missiles, um, and, the, and um, all of the regional activities, um, is to make sure that you're addressing all of those without an Iranian nuclear weapon as the underpin. Otherwise, we're having the conversation we were having in the first session today about Iran and strategic stability and instability and escalation and crisis, you know, the, and that we didn't want to have that conversation. So deal with Iran, take the nuclear weapons off the table, and then deal with the, the other issues. Um, and the only other thing that I would add on, on this point is that um, it is extremely important to recognize that this was also not intended to be the complete Iran nuclear deal. This was an Iran nuclear weapons capability deal. And that's why they do continue to have some civilian nuclear um, activity. Uh, they they have the nuclear power um, plants that are being operate that were built by Russia and are being operated and producing electricity. They're pursuing medical um, nuclear use of um, sorry. They're pursuing medical isotopes based on nuclear and radiological technology. They are you know they are looking forward at a robust peaceful nuclear program, and. So, you know, one argument people could, could make would be that they shouldn't have any of that either. And I, I just disagree with that um, because I don't think that they were in a position where we could take everything off the table. So it was in Iran, nuclear weapons capability scope, and that was what the deal ended up achieving. Before taking more questions at this point, I would like to collect uh, two or three questions at a time before answering. I'd like to make um, a couple of comments about the JCPOA and this idea of fixing the deal. Um, and I just want to add to what Corey mentioned. Uh, that if you think about it from, from an Iranian perspective, uh, really a deal is a deal. Was it exactly what everybody in the, within the Iranian establishment wanted out of it? No. Was it exactly what everybody in the US wanted out of it or the Europeans? No. But it's an agreement everybody signed off of it. So any idea of fixing anything about it would mean going back on the deal. And I would like to go back on, on this idea of sort of course of diplomacy or diplomacy in general in the previous panel, which was discussed, which I think Jim was the one who mentioned that you need to have credible threats when you are sort of making demands of a, of a different country. And I think the second most important pillar of that same uh, equation is you need to have credible promises. Without any credible promises, you know, if, if again you put yourself in Iranian shoes, why would you think about even an, a, a different agreement, whether to fix it or an additional agreement, when the first one at the first place, there was no delivery of the promises? And so I think it's important when, when anybody thinks about fixing anything is that undermining that credibility of the promises could have way more detrimental effects than, than, than anything that could potentially be, uh, be fixed. And again, to go back on this, uh, some comments that it was about Libya and Iraq, at least for the Iranian context, yes, they do think about this analogy. That if you think about it, that always is the first step. So there is ambiguity, so we cannot attack. Let's verify everything. Once we make sure everything you know, is, is already under control, then what's the next step? And we are not happy about your military facilities and missiles. Let's get rid of them. Once the country has no missiles and no ambiguity about uh, the, the programs, then well, we're not very happy about the regime or the human rights issues, so let's get rid of the regime. So you have to think about both perspectives. And so somebody sitting in Tehran making decisions, why would they sort of set their foot down or sort of draw a line on, on what they would negotiate and where they would sort of uh, hold their stance? So. Um, my question has to do with uh, your um, optimism, Jim, for the MBT in mean, general, mm -hmm. and, and the, the now the growing, apparent growing interest in nuclear energy mm -hmm. by Iran's neighbors. So mm -hmm. my question is, both of you, um, whether you think, it, it seems odd that in a place filled with gas and oil and sunshine that this is the one thing that they'd all be pursuing mm -hmm. in the wake of the JCPOA. So, mm -hmm. Obviously, there are ways of preventing, but mm -hmm. are you worried that this is a serious thing and what can be done about it? That's fundamentally my question. I, I am. I would. Oh, I'm sorry. 
Um, the, the Pentagon keeps saying these two new types of nuclear uh, capabilities that are in nuclear posture review that they comply with the treaty obligations that the U.S. currently has. And after reading the excerpts that you guys have put out, I'm confused as to how. So I'm hoping you can explain that. Um, on the, uh, am I concerned? I am, I am concerned. I mean, there's a long history, too, of countries in the Middle East. I, mean, I don't know how many times Egypt has said it's going to build 12, 12 nuclear power plants. Sure. But it's pretty frequent. Uh, and I don't expect that to happen. The Saudis seem more serious about it. But they also are talking about going to, you know, the new prince is talking about solar, too. Um, right. They're going to do solar, too. Yeah. So I guess I'm concerned. I'd be more concerned if they insist on an enrichment or reprocessing option. That's sort of a line for me. I mean, there are lots of countries that have nuclear power. You can't build a nuclear weapon just because you have nuclear power. Does it complicate some things? Yes, because then you have a lot of scientists. Maybe you have a program that's big enough to hide some things or whatever. But in the main, it really comes down to can you make the material? You don't have a car unless you have an engine, and you don't have a weapon unless you can produce material. And so I think that's where the sensitivity is. And as I alluded to, I think the Saudi thing is a tough case. In an ideal world, I would support the gold standard. No, enrichment reprocessing. And then you have this sort of classic debate throughout the history of the nuclear age, reflected in, you know, atoms for peace and everything else. You know, how much do you facilitate in order to have leverage? If you press too far, will they go rogue? I don't know where that uh, is, but I was, I'm part of a group of people who are doing, uh, producing a set of analyses on uh, Saudi Arabia, so I'm going to be interested to read that, but I, I don't have a quick and easy answer. Yeah, I think um, I agree that enrichment and reprocessing is where I'm, where I'm concerned and nuclear power plants I'm not concerned about in general. I mean, obviously there are safety, security, other issues, mm -hmm. but I, have, I, I, I trust the ability of, of most countries with, um, to be able to handle those challenges. Um, and, and I don't think it's unreasonable to think about countries pursuing nuclear. I mean, I, um, you know, in the end, nuclear is the only uh, low carbon base load power available. And we can talk about solar, and we can talk about wind, and we can talk about hydro, and maybe they'll get there, but they have not been scalable to the point nuclear um, has been. And we are looking at, you know, lower um, gas prices, lower oil prices. Um, there, I mean, there's a lot of fluctuation there, but, um, but there are, there are reasons why countries could legitimately want to save their ex their their resources for export and um, deal with their local uh, domestic power um, uh, in in other ways. Um, there are also, you know, in certain countries that are looking into nuclear, there is, there are major water problems, and the potential for nuclear plants for desalination is also something that is, I think, a reasonable argument. So I wouldn't I I don't like. To look at any country and say um, say that automatically they shouldn't be a candidate for nuclear power. Okay, so setting that aside, what about enrichment and reprocessing? Um, there is a, a challenge in the U.S. holding, trying to hold um, other countries to a standard that nobody else um, has agreed to, and I do think that countries have a right to be annoyed by that. Um, <laughs> and I think that other countries have a right to say to look around the world and say you were able to develop keeping all your options open, and maybe you didn't choose to exercise your options. As a many, as, as Jim says, most countries with nuclear power have not chosen to exercise that option, but they have it. And I think that um, putting something at the beginning where you say you will never do it is problematic. I think keeping that as an objective, a policy objective, is perfectly reasonable, and looking at other ways where you can say, all right, we can give you favorable terms on something if you say that to the extent you are exercising your contractual um, you know, your contractual options, um, during that time you will not be pursuing enrichment and reprocessing. You know, that can get you 10 years, 15 years. Um, my current boss uh, wrote a study out of MIT where he, you know, Ernie Moniz, where he really talked about the value of looking at those kind of medium term commitments. Um, and, and I think that we have a lot of policy options and levers to do that. And I would, I personally would support that because in the end where we have seen, um, at least in, in the few cases, where there have been countries who have gone out to choose a nuclear supplier, they're not choosing U.S. technology because the burden is extremely high, and mostly they're choosing Russia. And I don't think that there's about, I don't think it's a good outcome to have Russia be the the only kind of major 
nuclear vendor that is commercially credible. Are you um, the cost I'm not sure exactly which two capabilities you are referring to, so the, I, I don't know if you could clarify. Sub launch and the sea launch. Oh, okay. Um, everyone says that we can develop, or the, the Pentagon says mm -hmm. that we can develop these two new weapons without going against any of our treaty obligations. Will, can you think of a treaty obligation that's on sea base? So, so my um, my understanding of the, the two new capabilities, just to be absolutely clear, would be to uh, introduce a low yield capability to an existing missile that's already on a submarine launch ballistic missile, and that would not affect. I mean, you're actually, I mean, you can argue about whether it make use more or less likely, but you're reducing the overall capability of the arsenal because it has a lower yield. And then the other one would be to reintroduce, and they haven't, I don't believe, decided on basing mode, although most people believe it would be on attack submarines, to reintroduce cruise missiles. Um, sea launch cruise missiles. Sea launch cruise missiles, on, probably onto attack submarines, although they've left open other basing modes at sea. Neither of those would be, uh, would be covered by any existing treaty. So the argument is that it goes against the spirit yes. of the treaty. Yes. And um, and and that's not you know I, of, the I, of the NPT. Yes. I, and, I, I agree and, with and that. I don't yeah. and I don't say that I don't want to say that in a snide way. I mean, what we do and how we approach our nuclear posture, our nuclear forces, force structure, numbers, everything else. You know, it, it has it, it does play into both the political environment in which we're operating, and it plays into the sense of are we ever intending to make good on our Article 6 obligation, um, uh, which is Article 6 is what um, Jim cited that says that we'll negotiate in good faith for nuclear disarmament in the context of general complete disarmament. Um, so, you know, every, every president since the NPT was negotiated of both parties has always reinforced Article 6. Um, and I think that it is important that we have, you know, if we as a as a country are going to pursue new capabilities, I think that the country, the government, the military and civilian leadership need to explain why doing so is not running counter to the, the obligation that we've made under the treaty. I don't think that's an argument where they have to say why any individual system is not contrary to the treaty because the treaty doesn't actually govern systems at all. And frankly, it doesn't govern numbers. And as you heard yesterday, we're 85% of the numbers that we were at at the height of the Cold War. So you know we're still not e bumping up against levels that at other times have been acceptable under the nonproliferation regime. You know, that said, I think these, these capabilities are extremely problematic. I'm not comfortable with them. I don't think they are needed. I think that they introduce more instability than, than solving problems, but I don't think that they violate the NPT. I agree with all that, but I, I must say it's hard for me to accept the notion that we're going to build more nuclear weapons and we're going to build more types of nuclear weapons and we are being consistent with the NPT. I find that hard to swallow, frankly. Um, a quick question for Melissa and then one for the three of you. One, in the context of North Korea, you had mentioned that as um, with the advent of uh, 3D imaging that we would start having to look for powder on ships and being imported in, um, and obviously that's, a, that's going to be a, a needle in a haystack. What is the timeline um, that you think that, that we're going to have to start looking there? And then secondly, larger, um, in the context of Iran, and, um, you know, we've heard a lot uh, from Zarif and from Rouhani in recent days, I think probably understandably from their point of view of how frustrated they are with what's coming out of Washington and threats to scrap the deal um, and, again, not recertify and all of this. And I'm just wondering, with elections on the horizon, um, what is the Iranian public's attitude now? I mean, do we find that most Iranians, um, you know, from the people on the street to more people closer in, in the the government um, feel that maybe we should just preemptively or say, fine, screw it, we're done with this. Um, so for North Korea, um, it's really tough to prove an absence of information, right? So we have never seen a manufacturing level additive manufacturing capability. Um, We've seen small, like like the 3D printer you might buy for your kid or something like that on trade shows in North Korea. So North Korea has these small ones, nothing you would use 
like on the level of China or, or like GE uses in the US, things like that. Um, I think they're interested in it. We haven't seen no official photos. We have seen the machine tools. Kim Jong-un um, visits <coughs> factories, primarily automotive types of factories or tractor kind of factories and things like that where we can see the machine tools. We haven't seen like some of the most precise and scary types of machine tools there. That is what I'm looking for as a predictor. So right now they have launched uh, one Hwasong 15, they've done two Hwasong 14s. This is their ICBM class. Um, I think at this point what they need to do is make more of everything. So they need to make more warheads, more missiles, and more launchers. So for me, the things I'm looking for as predictors are all those things, of th those kinds of things. We, we still see, when we see the really big eight or now nine axle, huge truck, that red truck that came from China, we don't see more of those. I think China actually is embarrassed. They, they think that was against their interest and they're probably not giving them any more. North Korea is still refurbishing these Belarusian Maz um, tr trucks, truck beds too, and carrying sort of trailer trucks that you don't actually use to launch the missile, you're just moving them around. So, but what we do see is Kim Jong-un visiting auto, uh, like um, auto places and tractor places. We're now seeing these trucks that have these caterpillar treads on them. So what I'm looking for are, are signs of their, their um, industry getting interested in those, and those are starting to, but I have seen no evidence of a huge like level 3D printing machine. That, but that's theoretically where you'd go. How long do you think it'll take to get that? They already exist, so they either have to get one and reverse engineer it, or they have to learn how to make it from, um, from the sort of smaller ones. With all of these capabilities, this attractive manufacturing the machine tools and so on and so forth, it's not that hard. It, it's a little bit hard, but it's, it, the hardest part of the machine isn't making the machine or re reverse engineering the machine. It's the software that comes with it. And um, you know, there's a lot of debate about whether we're hacking North Korea's missiles or not. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't, it, the data is low. I don't think there actually is evidence that we are hacking North Korea's missiles. But if I wanted to hack North Korea's <coughs> missiles, I would sell them some really terrible machine software, machining software. On, on the internal, uh, I think that's probably a question for you. Uh, there's some polling, you know, University of Maryland does uh, polling in the region, including Iran. I think they've released a couple of polls recently. I would doubt that the population is at the point where they want to chuck the deal, but I would defer to your expertise on that. I, I think the population is generally dissatisfied with the economy um, and doesn't think that what they thought as a result of the deal would be delivered has been delivered. But I don't think they're at the point that they're sort of uh, expressing opinions whether Iran should withdraw or not. They just, they're just pushing for getting more of the benefits. And um, I think the government is, is really in a very tough situation right now. And I, I, I feel like they genuinely want to stick with the deal. And they're, they have made, um, not only sort of internationally, they're really going out of their way to try to draw as much benefit as they could and use different partners to sort of make the economic effects be more. But also internally, um, Rouhani and Zarif has made many different sort of changes that probably media here doesn't pick up whether it's within the foreign ministry or within the central bank or different sort of uh, smaller scale executive policies to sort of uh, amplify the effect of the deal. But the problem is, as, as all of you know, the uncertainty that exists. And in addition to that, the sort of uh, uh, twisting of the arm that the US does, it used to be just for the Europeans, now it's expanded to Asia as well, is, uh, is creating a lot of different problems. Um, for the government, you know, exchange rates, which uh, a lot of you may have read about it uh, in, in the recent weeks, have been something that the, the population has been very dissatisfied because obviously when the exchange rate sort of changes and uh, real devaluates, it, it, it impacts inflation considerably. And we're getting close to the new year uh, in Iran and everybody sort of, it, it's not a very pleasant situation. So government is in a very tough position, but I would say 
they're really still envisioning trying to maintain within the deal and unless I don't know that it, it, it really the scale tilts in a way that they really have no choice that they feel like they're just not getting any benefits out of it and they have to make a push. Yeah, you saw the vice foreign minister's remarks this year, uh, this week or two weeks ago about pulling, referencing pulling out. And I guess I would ask myself, what would you do if you're in Iran's shoes? So you know that the Europeans are trying to come up with ways to satisfy the American president and to compromise and whatever to keep him on board, right? So if I'm Iran, I'm probably looking for ways to push that leverage back, right, against the Europeans so that they don't cave. Right? Uh, so that's sort of the prism through which I interpret that wrong, wrongly or rightly. I think let's collect all the remaining questions and then answer to our yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank